My name is uh, Will Thorne, as, as Stuart said, and I was told not to touch the mic. I'm going to do my best <laughs> to not touch it and obey. And uh, amen. I'm just getting all set up here. I think the slides are up. Awesome. Thanks so much, brothers. Sometimes those things don't work well and you're scrambling last minute, but praise God for the AV team and, and uh, all that they do behind the scenes. Uh, as Stuart said, my name is uh, William Thorne. My wife Chelsea and I have been married for uh, about nine years. Uh, we've got three uh, beautiful children there, uh, a six-year-old, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old. And we've been living in Sydney, Australia for the last almost 11 years. Uh, we've been leading the church there for the last uh, few years. Uh, unfortunately, we uh, were unable to get a long-term visa to stay. So we've been living there for a while on different work visas and and you know how government's always so smooth and easy, and, and, but this was a rare case where it wasn't. And uh, so, so we, 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 appealed, we, we applied, we appealed, it was a whole process. Anyway, we, were, we weren't able to stay, and so we had to leave uh, Australia, for, and, uh, which was you know, very, very dev devastating for us. Um, but we're uh, you know, fighting to be faithful and trust God on this journey here about, his, about our next steps. And, uh, but we loved the church there. Uh, we loved our time there. Uh, all three of our children were born there. Uh, that's, that's the Sydney Opera House, obviously. That's called Uluru, this big rock in the middle there uh, of Australia. As you can tell, my daughter had a great time. <laughs> she loved it there. <laughs> but she did have a great time, actually. Last weekend, we went to a father-daughter dance, our first father-daughter dance. And she had a great time. As you can tell, I have, I have many outfits right now. Um, <laughs> didn't realize that till it was too late. <laughs> We're moving country, you know, you only, can, only got so many shirts you can bring. I wanted to give you guys a quick update about the, the, what's called the spa region. Sounds for South Pacific and Australia. So the spa region is, is 14 uh, churches, about 14 churches scattered across about five countries there. And, uh, and uh, God's really been working there in the last 10 years. Uh, we, we're mostly in Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, Papua New Guinea. We have a small house church in New Caledonia as well, and so we're trying to get to the islands too. Uh, but when we, when we arrived there, uh, along with several other uh, great couples in 2013, uh, there was about 700 disciples in the spa region. Uh, now today there's over 1,500 disciples. So it's more, it's more than doubled in that, in, the, in that time. There's been three Australian evangelists and women's ministry leaders appointed in the last two years, so that's been incredible. Uh, we planted two churches in the last 18 months. Uh, that's Newcastle, which is about two hours north of Sydney, and Christchurch, New Zealand. Uh, in January, we sent a team of 15 people from Sydney up to Newcastle with a young couple leading it, and they've had 13 baptisms already in, in that church. So 15 of them, 13 baptisms, which is awesome. Uh, there they are. Here's the photo of some of them and, and, and the brother there. That's, uh, he was being appointed evangelist in July there, Ben. Uh, great brother there. And so, again, that's the same. Is that the same outfit again? Oh, my gosh. Okay, this is embarrassing. <laughs> I gotta get some more clothes, okay? <laughs> oh goodness, who spotted that? I should have moved on quickly. Right, here's another photo. I'm in that. I'm not wearing the same outfit, okay? It's a different. There we go. That. <laughs> I changed my. Okay. Anyway, I'll, next time. Um, that's that's our staff in Sydney. Uh, we, uh, staff had grown to about 15. Uh, and the average age, and there's some of our elders, deacons would come sometimes as well, but the average age of our staff in Sydney when we left was about 26 years old. We were 33, so we were the ones raising it. So us leaving now has lowered it. And, but a great group, fired up group. They're faithful disciples uh, and, and just doing an incredible job. And, uh, and we, we, again, we love that group. And uh, when we got to Sydney in 2013, there was about 160 disciples. Uh, now there's about 415 disciples in the Sydney church. And so on the way to tripling, in about 11 years there, which is incredible to see how God has really worked in a great way uh, over that time. Um, I did want to say, uh, just, just before I, I dive into it here, just a big thank you to the church. Thank you to you guys, to the Millers, to the Mains, and, and, all, and the whole team here uh, for having us. Uh, you know, we're, we're so grateful to be here, to spend this time with you. Uh, we're here for a few days, and uh, you guys, are, you're so blessed to have them here. Uh, leading you and, and just, uh, you know, so hopefully you are grateful for them. And we're grateful to be here and spend time with you guys. I, like, like Stuart promised, there is an old photo I found of Stuart uh, with my sister. I couldn't find one of me and him, but that's him with my sister there. As you can see, 
Uh, for about 35 years, how old is Stuart? Are you 30, 36. So for about, for about 36 years, people have been trying to open books and the Bible and, and show Stuart who is God. <laughs> and she's been trying to show him about God, and it still hasn't worked, I guess. I don't know. So, I'm just kidding. Okay. He can, he can take a joke, I think, right? Okay. But yeah, it is, it's, it's awesome to, to see, see him and spend time with him. And uh, yeah, our, our parents were, were in uh, Chicago together, and my, my parents were in the Bible talk. His, his parents were leading there for a little while, a small group. And so it is great to be here to connect with all of you. I did want to share today some lessons from the mission field. And these are some things that we learn in our 10 plus years living overseas. Uh, like, like, like most good lessons, we made a lot of mistakes. And so, and that, but often that's the best way for us to learn. You make mistakes and you learn and you grow through that. And we're going to focus on the Apostle Paul as we do that. I read this book a couple years ago. I don't know if you've read this uh, a biography of Paul by N.T. Wright. Fantastic book, but it really got me digging deeper into Paul's life and inspired me to think about a lot of these things. And, and these aren't lessons to, to tuck away and, and put in your notebook and store for when you maybe want to go to Frankfurt and say, I'm going to join a, a mission team someday. I believe these are lessons that apply to our lives today as disciples because because when Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, believe it or not, he meant the one you currently live in. And so that applies to us today. This is not, okay, I'll, one, one day I'll go on the foreign mission field or something, and I'll, then I'll be radical. What about today? What about starting today? Let's say a prayer, and we'll talk about three points. Let's bow our heads. Father, thanks for this time to be together here with the Boston Church, and uh, thank you for the fellowship, for the communion that we have together. God, we're so grateful that, that uh, your, your word is spread all over the world and that we have brothers and sisters in Australia and here and, and, and Europe and all over. God, we're so grateful for how you're working. I uh, pray you speak through me today, God. Pray for a great fellowship afterwards. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. First point is God can use anyone. God can use anyone. We're going to be kind of looking at different uh, letters that Paul writes, and we'll look at the book of Acts as well. So we'll be jumping around a little bit, and I'll, I'll get most of it on the slide for you guys there. So, uh, you know, Paul describes himself a bit in 1 Timothy, and he says, he describes himself there. He says he was a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent man, and then he goes on to say, I was the worst of all sinners. So you may think you're bad, but at the very worst, you're second place. You can get a silver medal. It's better than the U.S. men's basketball team, okay? So that's pretty good. So, it was this fact, okay? <laughs> and then he goes on later, and even in, in Corinthians, he, he explains he wasn't even the most skilled. And this is in 1 Corinthians 2. He says, you know, I, I came, I didn't have eloquence. I, I didn't know anything. I, I just knew Jesus, but I, I was weak. I was afraid. I was trembling. I didn't have wise and persuasive words. So he's the worst sinner of all time, who is a bad speaker, He's weak, he scares easily, and he has a violent past. Not what you're typically looking for on a resume. You know, hey, yeah, that's the guy I want to lead this church. Not, not what you're typically looking for, but God still used him in incredible ways to plant churches all over the Mediterranean and convert thousands and thousands, and we're still talking about him today. And he's still impacting our lives today. It's actually a really, really common biblical theme that God uses unexpected people to do incredible things. And there are probably hundreds of examples I can use. Let me give you a couple right here. God can use anyone. I think about David and Goliath, you know. I mean, David, the truth of the matter is David is like a teenager who likes to write poetry and sing songs. Not what I'm looking for in a fellow soldier if I'm going into battle, you know. But God says, I'm going to turn that little guy into a warrior. I'm going to turn him into a warrior. I think about the story of Balaam's donkey. We, we preached through numbers recently in Sydney. Great story there, about three chapters long. Uh, long story short, God basically uses a donkey to rebuke Balaam because Balaam's going to curse the Israelites and, 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 he's, and he's, God's trying to get his attention and wake him up. So he opens the mouth of the donkey, speaks to the donkey and rebukes Balaam. And, and, and it's just kind of this weird story. It's actually a little known fact. It's the origin story of Shrek. That's a whole nother sermon for another day. I love this verse, too, in Luke, where, where, where John the Baptist is dealing with the Israelites, and they're religious, and they would often rely on their past, Abraham, and, and they're not changing, but they're, but they're religious. And, and John the Baptist says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and don't begin to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you, out of these stones, God can raise up children. So God doesn't even need a, a human or a donkey. He can just use flat-out rocks. 
That's what God can use. And again, there are many other examples I, I could point to. One more back to Paul. You know, we often think of Paul as kind of like, okay, there's the road to Damascus. He's converted. And then he goes on these missionary journeys and changes the world. Not quite. There's actually a 14-year gap before he really does anything significant, before he goes on his first missionary journey. And he's in Arabia, he's in Jerusalem, he's in Tarsus, and, and, and no one really knows exactly what he's doing during that time. But, but Paul's a late bloomer, really. You know, I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a pretty long time from conversion to, hey, I'm having any sort of significant role here. That encourages me because I'm, I'm, I'm 33 years old. And when you're in your 30 to 33, that's, about the, that's the age of Jesus' ministry, traditionally, is kind of what they say. And so when you're, when you're that age, you start thinking about Jesus and his life, and then, you, of course, you think, what am I doing with my life? Okay, I got to get it together. I got to, you know, I'm 33. Gosh, this is the age Jesus was when he died. What have I done with my life? You start stressing out a little bit. Maybe that's just me. I don't know. Uh, but it encourages me because I think, okay, I'm turning 34 soon, but, but I still got my Paul years to look forward to. Because he, he started going when he was about 41. And so let me get into my Paul years. So I'll, I'll take a break for the next seven years. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but he's a late, he was really a late bloomer. And so you got, you know, you got David who's this little poet boy, and you got the donkeys and the late bloomers and the stones. God can use anyone or anything for his glory. The vessel matters very little to God. You know, I, I personally, I can relate to Paul. I, I grew up in our church, our, our family of churches in, in Los Angeles. But I, and I quickly, as I was growing up, I quickly figured out how to live a double life. I, I would go to church, kind of keep my parents happy, keep the, keep the leaders happy a little bit. Uh, but I, as I was in high school and even into uni, uh, university, that's, uh, I still speak Australian sometimes. I got to get that out of my system a little bit. But, uh, or British. I don't know. It might be British as well. Um, but I got, into, I got into drugs. I got into, into drinking, partying, impurity, uh, all, all sorts of stuff. And then I would lie about it. I was deceitful. Uh, it was a pretty dark time. It was a messed up, I, was, I was messed up and I was, I was lying about it. I wasn't getting help. And I, I was hiding stuff. And, and, and praise God for his patience. Uh, that, I, that, that God worked and, and convicted my heart and did different things in my life to get my attention, that I was able to repent. I got open. I said, I got to repent. I got baptized. Praise God for that. But I can wrestle with, why should God use me? You know, and, 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 and he probably should have given up on me a long time ago. And, and I know there were people in my life that were trying to help me, and I know they were frustrated with me at times. And, 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 but why should I wrestle with these thoughts as well? I got to fight to have this faith. Hey, the vessel does not matter to God. It's not about the vessel. And, and we all know the scriptures talk about this, and, and, and this, is not like a, this is not like some new radical point, right? We've all probably heard this point before. We've, we've heard points like this. We've heard sermons like this. Yet how often do we still think thoughts like this? You know, God can't use me. I, I, I'm not a great speaker. I don't know my Bible well enough. I'm not that confident kind of person. I'm, I, I'm not extroverted. I'm not, I'm not, I've never helped someone become a Christian before. I'm, I'm I'm not blunt enough to have that hard conversation. I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm discouraged. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. On and on and on. All the clever reasons we come up with for why the vessel matters. When we know over and over again, God is telling us through the scriptures, the vessel does not matter. It's not about the vessel. It's all about him. We make it about the vessel. We're making it all about us. And we take faith out of the equation. Instead of saying, I got faith that God, of course I have faith that God, it's all about God. Who, what can God do through anybody? In fact, God seems to like it better if you're sort of a messed up vessel. There's all the stories like that, you know, and I even think about what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians. You know, we have this treasure in jars of clay so that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. We're, we're, we're the jars of clay. The treasure is God on the inside, but when we're cracked, the light shines through. So why not embrace our cracks and say, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit messed up. I got some issues, and, but, but, it, but God can still work through me. Because if God can use the donkey in Balaam's life, I think he could probably use some of the donkeys in this room. Because some of us, myself included, we act like donkeys sometimes. But hey, God can use you too. And, and so this, let, us, let this call us to greater faith. We've got to turn those faithless thoughts around. I'm not sure, really sure God can use me because I'm so anxious. No, that's exactly why God wants to use you, to prove, to show his glory, to show his glory. So I'm going to close out this point is using an example here. Some brothers that, uh, they're good friends. I love these brothers, but they drove me crazy. 
and, and I'm not trying to be down on them. You'll see. The story turns around, of course, as you can probably predict here. <clears throat> But, but these guys, that's Raph on the ladies. He's got brothers from Sydney, they're, they're good friends. And, and, but different, this was probably about seven years ago. Uh, Raph was, we were leading the teens ministry in Sydney. Raph was baptized. But then he kind of got, you know, he started growing up. He got into 11th, 12th grade. And he started just going, he kind of got worldly and, and was lying. And it's sim- very similar to my story. So I kind of connected to that. I said, you got to turn this around, bro. And, but we were leading the teens, and it was, it was difficult. It was frustrating. I wanted him to be spiritual, and I was trying to help him, but, it, but it was, it was, it, you know, we were talking to his parents and the elders, and it just got difficult. We event, he was in 12th grade. We said, look, you can't even be in the teens anymore. You're, this, is, this has gotten bad. You've got to go to the campus ministry. Maybe they can help you. And uh, uh, <laughs> that's what we did. And, uh, of course, when I, we had that conversation, and then the very next week we had a teen meeting, and he came. And I said, when I, when I said don't come anymore, I meant don't come anymore. And anyway, it was, but it was, we were trying to help him. That was, the goal was to, to help him because we didn't want him to influence. We wanted him to be influenced because he needed that. And so uh, and at the, around the same time, Ben was, we were leading the, the west region of Sydney. Ben was baptized. He was there. And he, he, had, he had been baptized from, from the world, but he, and he sort of had gotten a little bit critical. And, and, and again, we all go through our patches like this sometimes, and, or we can and, uh, and he, I remember one time he sat down with me, and, and he was like, hey, I went to visit this other, our other, another one of our churches in another country. And he said, the evangelists there are so much better than you, bro. I was like, thanks, man. He's like, yeah, they bring a ton of people to church. And I was like, okay, I'm sorry. I was like, you want to go share our faith right now? And so anyway, we did that. But, but just, it was, it was frustrating because I love these guys and we were friends, but it was, uh, but, but it was, it, and, and if you had told me six or seven years ago that this, this would be a turnaround story, I, I, I mean, these, these guys were, my wife can attest to, they would stress me out because they were great. They were, they were great brothers and influential, but they just weren't being spiritual the way I think God wanted them to be. And, and again, I, I'm, I'm no different. I know I stress people out too when I was going through my time. And, uh, but, it, but now if you, a keen eye, this is a little plot twist here. Well, notice you can maybe recognize these brothers from the first couple pictures, because Raph is the guy, at the start of this year, we hired him to lead our campus ministry in Western Sydney. And, and Ben is the brother that I just, we just appointed evangelist. So, so, so seven years ago, you had told me that. I said, you are crazy. You know, you're crazy that, that, and, and that, that God, you know, I don't, I'm not sure, but God can use anybody. God can use anybody. And we all go through our times, and maybe, that, maybe, maybe you're feeling it right now. Maybe you're feeling, uh, that, you know, it's been a hard time, and can God really use me? Let me remind you, the vessel does not matter to God. Let's have faith that God will use us and embrace our cracks to his glory. Second point. Second lesson here. The gospel still spreads. The gospel, or the gospel spreads. Um, over the last few years, when you heard about things spreading, it didn't generally have a positive connotation. And, uh, but that's not what Paul had in mind when he talked about things spreading. When he writes um, 2 Thessalonians, and he's writing to the church there, and he's asking for prayers, and he says, uh, you know, ask for other matters, brothers and sisters, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you. Um, the Greek word here for spread rapidly is traiko. And uh, it means to, to run, to hasten, to hurry. It's used of runners in a race. The ESV says something like speed ahead. Um, and, and you kind of get this image of someone running hard, running with all their heart. No, nothing's hindering them. And I, I, do, I would like to thank uh, Kevin for posing for that photo. Kevin Miller, he posed for that photo for me so I could put that slide up. <laughs> Appreciate that, bro. That's that image of, of a runner running hard. And, and, um, but it's interesting because Paul specifically says pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly. What he doesn't say is just as significant as what he does say. Because he does not say, pray that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly. And that's important because that's not actually something you need to pray for. The message of the Lord is going to spread. That's what it always has done and what it always will do. That's not something we need to pray for. Paul says, pray for us. But the message of the Lord, that spreads. It always spreads. It's just how it works. Pigs play in the mud. Dogs fetch sticks. The Yankees lose. And the word of the Lord spreads. Okay? That's just how it works. That's just how it works. I knew that would be a good one. Bashing the Yankees. I figured I can't go wrong with that. Quick scriptures here. Some examples of the rapid spread. 
Uh, and there's, there's a bunch. I mean, it's all over the scriptures. I think about Isaiah 55. You know, the word goes out from my mouth. It doesn't return empty. It's all over Acts, Acts 6. So the word of God spread. The numbers of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. Acts 12, but the word of God continued to spread and flourish. Acts 13, the word of God spread. Acts 19, that way the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. And even when Paul writes to Timothy towards the end of his life, he talks about how he's suffering to the point of being chained. But he says, and he reminds him, but God's word is not chained. This is simply what the message of the Lord does, brothers and sisters. It spreads rapidly wherever it goes. Some of these are after spiritual highs, you know, great things happening. Some of them are after spiritual lows. But it doesn't really matter. The word of the Lord spreads no matter what. Since the Old Testament through Acts in the early church, for the last 2,000 years, the word of the Lord has spread all over the world, and it is no different today. The word of the Lord still spreads today. But what determines what, whether the message will spread rapidly, Paul says, pray for us. Pray for us. We're the ones that need the prayers. And it's very similar to what Jesus teaches in, in Matthew 9 when he talks about the harvest being plentiful. But he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. You don't need to pray for the harvest. You need to pray for the workers. You need to pray. We need the prayers because the harvest is there. The word of, the God, the word of God is going to spread. We're the ones that need the prayers. We're the ones that need the faith to believe that this still happens today. The issue is us. And, and I think we can either help the gospel spread or we can hinder it. it it's going to spread. That's what God's word does, but are we gonna, am I going to help it along, or am I going to be difficult about it? Uh, I think that can be an encouragement, but also a convicting point. The, the, the convicting point is I don't want to hinder it with my life, you know, I don't, with my selfishness, with my pride, with my critical spirit. You know, I, I'm, I'm at church. I, I should be sitting there thinking about, uh, you know, in the fellowship, who can I, who, who's a new person I can meet and reach out to and love up on? I should be thinking about spreading the word of God, but if I got a critical heart, I'm thinking about what that sister just said to me. And, and, and we, we hinder the word of God with our critical spirit, and when we do that, we're flat out doing Satan's job for him. And Satan might as well take a vacation, because I'm doing his job for him when I get critical, and I, and I start hindering the spread of God's word. But the, it should be an encouragement as well, because, because the encouragement is God's word is going to spread, and all I got to do is kind of help it just move along a little bit. It, God's doing the heavy lifting. And how, and how often have you met somebody that says, man, I was praying to find a church. You reach out to somebody and say, I was looking for God. And, and, and that, what does that mean? That means God's been working in their heart for decades. And you just came along at just the right moment and just kind of helped. And you think you did, the, you, know, you, didn't, you, think you did everything. No, you, you did something. That was good. But, God, but it's encouraging because it's not all about me. It's not all about me. It's all about God. And, and he's got a master. He's doing incredible things. But I want my life to matter. I want to make a difference with my life. So what's required of us? A couple quick practicals to close out at this point. One, one thing I want us to understand is that the best defense is a good offense. I find as disciples of Jesus today that too often we are playing defense against the world. We think places are closed off. You know, my, my high school isn't very open, my, my, my college, my, my, co my co-workers don't care, they're too secular, they're too religious. We become like Goldilocks, you know, just, it can't be too secular or too, they gotta be just right, you know, and, 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 and people would say Australia is, you know, Australia is a more secular uh, nation, but okay, so what? So what? Or we get defensive because we're on the back foot with hot topic questions, politics, race, gender, marriage. You know, people ask us, you know, how, how, how can you believe in God if this, this, and this? And, and we kind of get, we get scared, you know, and can God create a rock so big he can't move it? And all these, you know, that's a logical fallacy, but I'm pretty sure. And um, uh, anyway, that's a whole, go to mission school or something, study that one out. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we, and so we sort of, we kind of get defensive because we don't, we don't always, I don't know, how am I going to answer that question about these hot topic questions? And, I, and so we, we get defensive and we, and we end up kind of wanting to hide from the world a little bit. And we're kind of looking for safety, scared to make mistakes, scared of the, word, the world. Just go to church and then go back to my room, go back to my dorm, and, and just hold on until Jesus comes back. But we've all heard this phrase before, and we all know the best defense is a good offense. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was not originally said by Bill Belichick. Sorry, guys. Pretty sure it was originally George Washington. Who knows? It's a very common quote. It's a military term. It's, we all understand it in sports. The, the concept is, hey, if... if, if 
who cares if our defense is bad? If, if we score on them 50 times, then we'll still win. You know, the, our best, it'll help our defense if we just go, go, go. We score as many points as we can. We shouldn't be hiding from the world. We should be going into the world and changing the world. Playing offense. We're the ones with the hard questions. You think you got hard questions? I got a hard question for you. How come you're still so empty inside if you found your dream job and your dream girl? I got a hard question for you. I'm not going to answer your question. Answer that question. I got another hard question. How come, how, how come you think the world has answers for love and romance when 50% of marriages are ending in divorce? Answer that question. Let's talk about that. I think God has the answers for those things. I'm not, I'm not playing on the back foot. I'm playing offense. Offense against the world. We got to stop being on the back foot and go score some points. Jesus taught us this when he said, Matthew 16, 18, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Often misunderstood verse, but the point I want to make, last time I checked, gates don't move. What does that imply? It implies we as the church are, are conquering and attacking the gates of Hades. Satan's not attacking heaven. We're like holding him back. We're attacking him. We're, on the, we're playing offense. You know, our movement was born out of, out of the churches of Christ. And, and in the 1950s and 60s, uh, it, it, was, it was commonplace in, in, the, in the kind of the mainline churches of Christ to, to send your, your if, if you, were, uh, you had some kids that were going to the high school, they graduate. It was very commonplace to send your children to the, to the, to the Church of Christ University. And so, like, you guys may have heard of Abilene Christian University or Pepperdine. They got a great view there, so that's understandable. Okay, but there's probably, there's others. I don't know if there's any up in the Northeast here. But it's kind of these universities that are, that are, that are founded by the Mainline Church of Christ because the parents are thinking, I don't want my kids going to the evil state school where there's partying and sex and drugs. I, I want them going to the good Christian school. But basically, our movement started when, when a bunch of young men and women got to, in, the, in the 60s said, you know what? flat out, why, why are we hiding from the world? We're, we're, let's go into the world. Let's go into the marketplace. Let's go play some offense. And guess what they started doing? They went to their state school, the evil, evil, evil state schools. You know, okay, gosh, okay. They, they went into those state schools. They lived in the dorms. They held Bible talks in the dorms. And tens of thousands of people were baptized. Because they had the faith to say, we're not playing defense against the world. We're playing offense. It reminds me of this quote from from Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, it's a Christian, you know, book type thing. <laughs> but where Mr. Beaver, I, I don't even know the story really, but Mr. this beaver, talking beaver, I suppose, is, is taking the children. He says, I'm going to take you to meet the king who's this Christ-like figure, and he's, he's, a, he's a lion. And the kids are like, you're taking us to meet a lion. Is he safe? And, and the beaver says, of course, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he's not safe, but he's the king, and he's, uh, he's good, and he's the king. You know, it, 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 Following Jesus was never meant to be safe. He told us that up front. And too often we're playing defense. We're looking for safety. We're looking for a safe place. And says, so hey, I want to take some risks with my life and make a difference with my life. I want to play offense for Jesus. I want to change the world. The second practical here is remember what you can take to the next life. I hope I'm doing okay on time here. We'll cruise along here. Um, there's only two things the New Testament teaches we can take with us to the next life. Anyone know what they are? Nope. Sorry. <laughs> well, there's a lot of things you can't take. We understand that, right? Okay, I can't take, uh, I can't take my home, my car, my clothes. If I could take clothes, obviously, I'd be taking this one outfit, you know, that'd be <laughs> my thing. <laughs> uh... You can't take your fantasy football team. Remember to set your lineup, okay? It's 1 p.m. Um, a lot of things you can't take. You can't even take, there's no marriage. Jesus has no marriage in heaven. But what can you take? Well, you can take your scars for Jesus, because Jesus' resurrected body, had, they, that's how they recognize him. You can touch, touch and feel. I got scars. And the second thing you can take is friends with you. Which is sort of a, an interesting concept. Jesus teaches us that. There's a really weird parable called the parable of the shrewd manager, where Jesus sounds like he's uh, endorsing embezzling money. And uh, you're like, what, is, what are you talking about, Jesus? And, uh, but, he, but basically, there's a guy who's going to get fired by his boss, and he knows he's going to get fired, so he goes out to his boss's clients, 
and, he's, and he cuts good deals for all of them so that when the boss comes and fires him, he can go back to those guys next week and say, hey, remember me, I made you such a good deal. You got any jobs? And, and Jesus is saying, use what you have now to set yourself up. And he says, basically, in the same way, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Use your life now to help your friends become disciples so that when you get to heaven, you actually know somebody. That's what he says. Because I don't want to rock up to heaven. And I, think, I made it. Praise God, I made it. I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know anybody here, you know. But I said, no, I, I, man, and I, I brought my friends along. And they're waiting there for me. Or I'm waiting there for them. And that's what I want my life to be about. What, what could have greater purpose than that? The gospel is going to spread no matter what. We can help it or hinder it. What do you want your life to be about? Let's be in the fast lane for the gospel. Let's take some risks and make this life count. Last point here to close out. We've got to have some spiritual grit. The Finnish people have this. I don't know if we have any Finnish people here, but they have this word called sisu. I don't know if you guys have heard of this. Uh, it's, it's a word that basically means grit. Grit means like I'm not, I'm not giving up even though things are hard. And the Finnish people, if you know, if you know Finnish people, they, they, this is their national character. They love this word. It means you know, tenacity, grit, bravery, resilience. They, they may not be the smartest or strongest, but they say we're not going to give up. And there's a violent movie that came out recently with this title. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but before I left Sydney, the brothers said we're taking you out to dinner and a movie. And it was kind of like a date, you know, and, um, and, which was, it was just fun. And I didn't, I didn't, they didn't tell me anything about it. They just said, show up here and there. And they took me to this. I had no idea what this movie was about. It's pretty violent. I don't think I can recommend it. But it's, about, it's called Sisu. But it's about this, this guy that finds gold at the end of World War II. And then the, the, Nazis, the Nazis bump into him. And they're trying to steal the gold and kill him. But the whole movie is, is him running away, fighting them and running. And, and, but, and he, he, doesn't, he's not, he doesn't have more men. He's not smarter. He's not braver. But he just won't give up. He won't. I'm not giving up. Even if things get hard, I'm not giving up. And I think Paul definitely has this same spirit. He doesn't give up when things get hard. Let me give you some examples here. What about the time where he's stoned outside of Lystra? There in Acts 14, uh, verses uh, 19 to 20 there. Uh, he, they're, they're, stoning, they're trying to kill him. They stone him. And you can imagine him being on the ground there, you know, bleeding, exhausted. And he, and he stands up and, he, and, he, and he, looks, he looks back into the city. He looks the other way. And he says, you know what, I'm going back in. I'm going right back into that city. Uh, and, of course, this is just his first missionary journey. He's going to come back to Lystra again. And that's where he'll meet Timothy. And that's where he'll, Tim, he'll take Timothy along with him. And, and uh, you know, if, if that's me, I'm like, hey, I'm, go, I'm so fired up to go on a, on a mission team. I'm going to go on a mission trip. It's going to be awesome. And then they start throwing rocks at me. That's where I'm like, all right, I'm done with this, I think. I think that's enough for me. <laughs> I was fired up, and then they started throwing rocks. <laughs> but not Paul. Not Paul. He's got that spiritual grit. Spiritual grit. Let me give you another example here. You know, in, in, his, in his charge to the Ephesian elders, this is his third missionary journey. And uh, in, in Acts uh, 20, and he says, uh, uh, he says there, he, he's, he's talking to the Ephesian elders. They're on the, they're on the water. They're in the sand at Miletus, and he knows this is the last time he's going to see them. And, uh, and he says, uh, he, he tells them, hey, in every city that I go to, the Holy Spirit keeps warning me that hardship and danger are coming. And all the people are weeping because they know it's the last time they're going to see him. But he says, it doesn't matter to me. I'm still going ahead. I'm still going ahead. Just because a hardship is coming doesn't mean Paul's changing course. Again, in, in, in uh, next chapter here with the prophet Agabus, a great passage here. I'm going to kind of give you the Will Thorne version of this. Uh, but basically, he goes to Caesarea, Paul. He continues on. Uh, this prophet Agabus comes up to him and rips off his belt, and, and which is sort of a strange thing to do to somebody. And, and he ties his own hands and his own feet together. And he says, and he's talking to Paul, and he says, in the same way, the owner of this belt is going to be bound and dragged before the Gentiles. And all of Paul's friends are weeping and crying, and they're saying, Paul, they're going to kill you. Don't go. Don't go to Jerusalem. Don't go. And Paul says, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to, to be killed for the name of the Lord Jesus. He says, why are you guys crying, man? I'm, I'm, I'm ready to die for Jesus. 
I'm not giving up just because some people are trying to threaten me. I'm ready to die for Jesus. Spiritual grit. Grit. Again, it, you know, he's in the midst of a hurricane here. It's, you know, just in case you didn't believe me that Paul had this quality, I have five examples, okay? So hopefully you believe it by the end. But, you know, this is in the midst of a physical storm. They're, they've gone 14 days of rain, no sun. Uh, it's dark. It's cold. They've thrown all the food overboard. They all think they're going to die. They're on this little boat, and it's storming. 14 days. 14 days of not eating, and there's a group of like 100 men. If I go 14 minutes without eating, I start to get a little cranky. You brothers understand what I'm talking about. You know, this is four, I mean, imagine a group of 100 men haven't eaten for 14 days. You know, but Paul stands up and says, hey, guys, I got faith in God that he's still going to work. Take courage. Take courage. That's not the speech I'm probably giving there. I'm shriveled up in a ball in the back, and I'm just thinking, oh, gosh, what, what, what's going on here? I want to give up. But Paul's the spiritual grit. And finally, when he writes to the, uh, you know, when he writes to the church in, in, in Corinth, and this is, this is sort of an insight into Paul's mind here, and it's a unique thing here. We don't, we don't often think of Paul as, as um, we think of Paul kind of preaching in front of thousands, and, but, but he, he talks about it, it wasn't always easy. He says, I don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We are under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. He's saying, I, I was so sad and so stressed out, I wanted to die. I mean, that's not really what you normally think about when you think about the Apostle Paul. So sad and stressed out, I wanted to die. But, but, but he says, but, you know, this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises from the dead. And he carries on. If Paul gives up in this moment, imagine you open up your Bible this morning and you're reading through it and there's no Romans there's no 2 Corinthians, there's no Ephesians, there's no Colossians, there's no 1 Timothy, there's no 2 Timothy, there's no Titus. And maybe, maybe Philemon as well. This is probably written about 56 AD, I think. And We miss out on like half the New Testament if Paul gives up at this moment. But he says, no, I got, I'm, I'm hang, I'm, it was so, I was so sad and stressed, I wanted to die, but I didn't give up. And I learned a lesson through that. It's a quality we have to strive for today as well. We're disciples of Jesus. We don't run away from the fight. We run towards the fight. We don't just give up if things get hard. That's not who we are. That's not what we signed up for. It reminds me of this quote from, from a show Chelsea and I watched called Silo, where all these people, they live in this giant underground silo. It's kind of a post-apocalyptic world, and it's all nuclear war above, and they live in this silo. It's 10,000 people, and they got a whole system of government. They have a mayor and a sheriff, and if you break a certain law, the sheriff's job is to take you to the surface and they send you out. They have, they have rules. They have laws. And I think it's based on a book or something. And, and one day, it's the, sheriff, the sheriff's wife is the one who breaks the law. And so it's his job as the sheriff to take her and, and send her out. And everyone's kind of like, oh, my gosh. And even, and even the, mayor, the mayor comes to the sheriff and says, hey, look, I know, I know you swore an oath to do this. Um, but, but we all understand, you know, if, if it's, it's your wife, this is difficult. And, and he says this phrase, or this quote, what's the value of swearing an oath if you only stick to it when it's easy? And I love that quote because it reminds me of following Jesus. What's the value in saying Jesus is Lord if you only follow him when it's easy? And it's, it's reminiscent of so many verses. I think about the verse in Job where Job's going through some serious suffering. He's lost his kids, his money, everything. And all he has left is his wife to comfort him. And she says, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. Thanks, sweetie. I appreciate that. <laughs> but he says, you're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? You know, hard times and good times. My, my commitment to God shouldn't be dependent on how good my life is going. If I can be honest with you guys for a minute, these last five months have been some of the most difficult months of my life. Uh, it was our dream to stay in Sydney. We loved the church there. We loved our job there. Uh, we wanted to raise our kids there. We loved our suburb. We had so many great friendships. Uh, it was our dream to continue to lead the church. And we had, you know, we had dreams and vision of, to plant more churches and to raise up evangelists. And, and, uh, and, and we, that, was, that, was, that was my mind. And so... This visa rejection, there was a process, and we appealed and different things, but when it finally became clear, probably about um, between April and June-ish, we were trying to last gasp fight, but it became clear, uh, you know, it, it was a lot to swallow at once, because it was, it was our job, it, it was our church, it was our ministry, 
it was our career, it was our, our friends, it, it, was our, um, it was our kids' friends, you know, and we're telling our kids, of course, and they don't, they don't want to move, they're crying, and you start thinking about your kids crying, and you just, oh my gosh. And uh, it was, it, it, for me, it was a lot to swallow at once, and it still is, I'm kind of still processing it. And, uh, but, but, what do I, but what do I do with that? Well, it's, been hard, it's been a hard few months. What do I do with that? I can't just accept good from God and not challenges. And, I, and I, of course, my challenges, I understand, are minor compared to Job and minor compared to what many other people in this room probably have gone through and are going through. I know that. I'm just, these are just my challenges right now. But I haven't always handled it well the last few months. I mean, I've been grumpy at God. I've been grumpy at people. And grumpy is probably a little bit of an understatement, Okay. That's a nice way of putting it. And, uh, but just, you know, I, I've been tempted to indulge in sin. I've been frustrated. I've been confused, many tears, and, and we've been fighting and, you know, wrestling. And, and, but, but through all that, you know, I've been learning. I've been learning that when I signed up to follow Jesus, it wasn't just for the good times. And the good times are good. We all love the good times. We, we want to stay in the good times always, but we all know that they, they come and go. And the storms come. That's life. Maybe you're in a storm right now. Maybe you're not. If you're not, congratulations. I'm happy for you, and, but it may be another storm coming. And that's, that's how life works. But I, that's what I've been learning. When I signed up to follow Jesus, it wasn't just for the good times. When I said Jesus is Lord, I knew there was no turning back. So what about you? With whatever hardships you're facing right now, this is the spirit God wants us to have as disciples of Jesus. No turning back. And I want to close by showing you uh, the lyrics of this song, telling a little bit of a story. Uh, again, just thanks so much for having us. It's been awesome being here with you guys, and uh, we're so excited for the fellowship afterwards just to keep connecting with you guys. And, um, but I wanted to, I wanted to do, um, you know, the, the story goes about this, that, that um, this guy, have you guys heard this song, I've Decided to Follow Jesus? And uh, uh, it's, it's written, it was said by this guy, I don't think they know his name. It was, the story goes, it was said by a guy as he's being killed for his faith in northeast India in the 19th century. He's being killed for his faith in Jesus alongside his entire family. And these, this is what he, those are the words he says. And then this guy comes along a little bit later, Mr. Singh, and he writes it down. Another guy is also martyred for his faith. Uh, he wrote it down, I think, in 1920. And, uh, and, and the lyrics go... You guys know the song. I'm not going to sing it, okay? So let's, we don't need to all stand and sing, okay? But, but I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. He says this as he's being killed for his faith. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. My cross I carry, I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. Why do you think he says no turning back over and over again? Probably because I got to get that message in my mind. Yeah. I need to hear that because <laughs> I'm tempted to turn back sometimes. Yeah. And I know it's been a challenging few years in the U.S. We've been overseas, but, you know, from afar we can see, and I don't know, not every place, but, but, but just it, it's been, you know, interesting few years to be away. And maybe it's affected you. Maybe, that, maybe it's, uh, you know, sh shaking your faith or maybe not. But, but you know, if, if it's been a challenging few years, I would say, and the Bible's full of challenging years. The Bible's full of challenging seasons. So maybe, maybe it's been a tough few years. You feel like you got punched in the face, but we're in a spiritual battle. And so what do you do when you're in a, in a, or a fight? We're in a spiritual fight. What do you do when you're in a fight if you get punched in the face? You stand back up and you punch back. That's what we do as disciples of Jesus. This is metaphorically speaking, okay? I don't, you don't have to fight. You understand what I'm saying. Don't fight, okay, physically. This is the spirit God is calling us to have. Maybe it's been challenging, whatever's been going on. For the disciples of Jesus in the Boston church, whether it's good times or bad times, this is our heart. No turning back, no turning back. Amen.